So as we uh, look at <clears throat> where's my where should I point to? Point right there. Okay. Um, so the first week, we're just going to try to uh, give an understanding for uh, the book itself. Uh, we'll not belabor the uh, dating of the book and uh, some esoteric things, although there are many esoteric things in Revelation. And um, uh, just hopefully give you a context for it. And then um, next week, we're going to alternate. Uh, Steve Holcomb has uh, graciously agreed to... Uh, I didn't have to break his arm, but I did twist it a little bit. And, um, and so he is going to take every other uh, week. That's the intention. If schedules change and, and uh, something prevents one or the other, then the other will step in. Uh, but next week we'll be uh, starting in chapter 1, verses 4 through 20, and he's going to deal with uh, Christ's care for the churches. And then uh, the following week, We'll get into um, the first three letters. Corey did a wonderful series, and uh, I think this will be an in-depth approach to Ephesus, Smyrna, and Pergamum. And then uh, the last four, and then we'll move in. Week five will be uh, the imagery that is used here in this symbolic language that is used throughout Revelation. Uh, of course, not literal language, but figurative language, uh, imagery, symbolic language to give us a, an understanding. The throne, the lamb, and the book in particular, uh, chapters four through six. And then um, God's people, uh, the 144,000 is discussed in chapter seven, and uh, the sounding of the seven trumpets, and on you go, I'm sorry? Okay, and on you go until we uh, get to the very end, uh, the eternal destiny of the redeemed. And that is what normally people think about when they think about Revelation. They think about um, end times, eschatology, these kinds of, of, of uh, expressions. But what I really like us to do, <laughs> in, as an alternate to that kind of thinking per se, is uh, to think about how Christ is portrayed as the victor, as uh, being able to overcome and defeat Satan and to defeat enemies of of uh, the king. And so we have uh, Christians share in the anointing and they are called out for a special purpose. Uh, we call that the ecclesia, the called out in the Greek, called out of the world for a special purpose. Anointing. People use this term anointing today, uh, unfortunately in a, in a uh, false way many times. Uh, the anointing that they may be talking about is some kind of spiritual uh, special revelation or some kind of uh, um, uh, in, in inspired Holy Spirit indwelling that gives them some special revelation. That's not the anointing that we're talking about. We're talking about being anointed for a special purpose. And so this is in, revealed to us in Acts chapter 10 and verses 34 through 43 and also in 1 John, this term for Christians being anointed is used. And then in so doing, I think it's easy to see that Jesus came as prophet, priest, and king. You could say he was an ambassador to bring us to, to, uh, to the Father. Nobody comes to the Father except by me, he said, John 14. And so we have this, every faithful disciple of Christ fulfills this same prophetic, priestly, and kingly role that he had on a junior level, of course. Uh, but we're anointed for those kind of purposes. So we're ambassadors, or prophets even, and tasked to um, proclaim God's word. And priests ordained to offer ourselves as sacrifices. And kings, which is rich in the book of Revelation. Kingdom and kings, his kingship and sovereignty, his rule. All of that is found. So kings enthroned to war against the Lord's enemies. We're serving with him now. Where is Christ? He's at the right hand of the Father. And he is reigning. And we are in his kingdom now, not kingdom come. We're not going to do this till kingdom come. We're in it now. We're in the kingdom. And so we are ruling with him. We're a royal priesthood, right? 
And if that's the case, we're given a charter to do things. So he's going to help us to expand the kingdom, and that is our mission. Let's turn to Revelation 17, 1 through 14, and see what, what does the book of Revelation talk about in terms of this kingdom. Revelation 17, 1 through 14. Then one of the seven angels who had poured, uh, or who had the seven uh, bowls, came and talked with me, saying to me, Come, and I will show you the judgment of the great harlot who sits on the many waters, uh, with whom the kings of the earth committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth were made drunk with the wine of her fornication. And, he, and so he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast, which was full of names of blasphemy, uh, having seven heads and ten horns, and the, uh, the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls and having in her hand a golden cup full of abominations and the filthiness of her fornication and on her forehead a name was written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the woman of harlots and of the abominations of the earth. And I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I marveled with great amazement. And with the angel, but the angel said to me, why did you marvel? I will tell you what the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carries her. Isn't it nice? I'll stop the reading in just a second. We're gonna learn what the mystery was. <laughs> Because with all this figurative language, you could get caught up in it and say, what is he talking about? Yeah, he's going he's gonna to tell us. And the beast that you saw was and is not and will ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition. And those who dwell on earth will marvel, whose names are not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world. Whose name was written in the book of life from the foundation of the world? The church. Ephesians says, before the world began, he ordained the church. Those that are in Christ, that's who's going to be in the book of life. Not your individual name, not foreordained and predestined, but the church, the plan of salvation. That was what was foreordained. And so these people are the ones that are not in Christ. They are not found written in the book of life before the foundation of the world. And so when they, verse 8, when they see the beast that was and is not and yet is, here, here is the mind which, which has wisdom. The seven heads of the seven mountains on which the, the woman sits. And there are also seven kings and five have fallen. One is and the other has not yet come. And when he comes, he must continue for a short time. And the beast was not, or the beast was and is not and is himself the eighth and is is also the eighth and is of the seven and is going to perdition. And the ten horns which uh, you saw are the ten kings who received no kingdom as yet, but have received, uh, they receive authority for one hour as kings with the beast. And these are the one mind that they will give their power and authority to the beast. And these will make war with the lamb. So a lot of Figurative language, probably talking about Caesars and Rome and their Roman Empire. And they're going to give over their, their kingdom to the Lamb. That is, to the, to the Lamb's kingdom. And so, what is that? Verse 14, And these make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb has overcome them. And He is the Lord of lords, and the King of kings, and those who are with Him are called chosen and faithful. Finally, we get to us. <laughs> Okay, the kingdom he's talking about is the church. The kingdom he's talking about is the body of Christ, the bride of Christ, those who are in the kingdom, those who are put on Christ, have put on their, their uh, wedding garments in baptism. And uh, on we could read, but I'll stop there. So you see there that there's a lot of imagery in this book. And I'll, I'll not do that to you again today like that. Um, but not exactly anyway. Okay, so... Uh, the book is rich with, with uh, difficult and, um, there we go. Blessed 
There are seven blesseds. There are seven blessings in the book of Revelation. Seven shows up a lot. Seven seals. We're going to get six seals tonight from Corey. The first six seals. Uh, that's not the Sea World kind of seals. These are seals that open the book. Look at the first one. Blessed is he who reads and hears and keeps the prophecy. You say, whoa, with readings like chapter 17, I don't, I don't see, I don't know, I don't. We'll get there. It's high level at first. Just give high level. What are we talking about? A war, a spiritual war. Blessed is he who reads this and hears it and keeps the prophecy. Second blessing, chapter 14. Blessed are the dead that die in the Lord. Where do you want to be? <laughs> Blessed is he who watches and keeps his garments. Be careful, right? Keep them unspotted. Blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. How would we be called to the marriage supper? How are we called in Christ to be a bride, the bride of Christ? We enter into that kingdom. We enter that relationship. Uh, blessed and holy is he who has a part of the first res of the resurrection. So we have this opportunity to be born again and to be raised in newness of life. If you're not a part of that resurrection, then you're going to be having a lot of problems later. But blessed is he who has put on Christ in baptism, walk in newness of life, have buried himself, have renewed himself, caused us to be a new creature. All right, in, verse 20, in chapter 22, verse 7, blessed is he who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. Very similar to the first chapter. And then blessed are those who do his commandments that they may have the right to the tree of life. Notice the tree of life is used. It's going to show up a couple of times. What does that remind us of? Eden. Wonderful. So if we do these things, if we hear, if we keep, well, what happens? Well, let's see if I can. There we go. To him that overcomes, he says these things. First seven are said by Christ. The last one is John writing. I will give the eat, uh, to eat of the tree of life. There it is again. Which is the paradise. It's in the paradise of God. So instead of re referring to it as heaven, he refers to it there as the paradise of God, which would be very similar to the paradise of Eden. Very similar language. In chapter 2, verse 11, he that overcomes shall not be hurt by the second death. What would the second death be? The separation between God and, and man. Be difficult for people to overcome that if they've been judged to go into hellfire. But we'll not be hurt by that. Uh, be given a new name. <laughs> we'll be given a new name if we overcome. And we'll be given authority over the nations, those, those people who um, are not uh, paying attention to God's will. And chapter 3, he says, we'll be given white garments, we'll be made a pillar of the new temple. The first temple's uh, destroyed, and so there's a new temple, a heavenly temple. And um, we are given uh, to sit with authority with Christ at his throne if you overcome, you get to do, and we've been reading about uh, Esther, and, and she comes before the king, and she does so at, she, she is even, she goes to the courtroom without, with a, to his court, to his throne area, to his area of, of authority, without being called. And so she takes a lot of risk, and then she further approaches the king. When we do these kind of things, we have to know that, there is a protocol, and he says, if you overcome, I'm going to give you the protocol. I'm going to give you the right to not only enter the courts of, of God, but also to approach me, actually to sit with me in my throne. Um, he said, my throne, I, I sit with me in my throne is what he says, uh, sit with Christ at his throne. Okay, in chapter 21, he's, uh, John goes on to say, 
if you overcome, you'll inherit these things. And this, the description of paradise is so rich that all of us would understand that we want to be there. Okay, let's understand what he's talking about in terms of these, this kingdom that would be coming. I know of no better place of understanding where the kingdom was prophesied uh, than to go to Daniel chapter 7. It's a long reading, but I think worthy of our attention because we spend so little time in the prophets. <laughs> and this is a book of prophecy, and so we go to other books of prophecy to see how they would work. So in Daniel chapter 7, there are four beasts and four kings that are described there. And that is referring to the Babylonian king kingdom, uh, the Medo-Persian kingdom, the Greek kingdom, and then finally the Roman kingdom. These beasts, these great beasts, chapter 7, verse 17. Let's read that section and keep reading. Have your text open or just follow me. I figured it might be easier just to follow along. These great beasts, which are four in number, are four kings which will rise upon the earth, but the saints of the highest one, the saints, that is those who are God's chosen ones, God's faithful, they will receive the kingdom and take possession of the kingdom forever for all ages to come. Is there any room in, in there for rapture and taking away and all that? Plant the seed now. No, there isn't. Okay, so this kingdom that will come during that time will be the church. He will establish his kingdom. And go on to read, and then I desire to know the exact meaning. He's right there with us, right? We want to know the exact meaning of the fourth beast. Well, it's Rome. The exact meaning of the fourth beast, which was different than all the others, exceedingly dreadful. Uh, with its teeth of iron and its claws of bronze, and it, which it devoured and it crushed and it trampled down and the remainder with its feet. When uh, Titus came in with his father backing him up as Caesar, Titus comes in and rules an army that comes in and defeats everything in its path. And the last thing they take is in 70 AD, they destroy Jerusalem down to the down to the foundations. They level it, they raise it. There is nothing left of the temple. There's nothing left of the scrolls. There's nothing left of the heritage. There's no proof of lineage. There is no way that they could establish who was in the proper line of authority to even give the sacrifices that were under the law of Moses. It was all removed and it was viciously so. So much so that Josephus says that there has never been anything like this before. Did Jesus say something like that? In Matthew, he said, and, and such suffering, such tribulation, such awfulness has never happened before, nor ever again. So read chapter 24 of Matthew sometime and, uh, and see what Jesus says is going to happen. Well, this is the viciousness that is referred to here. And then later, of course, under Domitian, that they actually uh, threw Christians and, and put them on post, used them as lighting tools, and um, threw them into the lion's den for sport. Well, this is the kind of viciousness that is referred to here. And so uh, all these kinds of things are going on, and they're foretold. So let's pick up the, this uh, reading again. Until the Ancient of Days, they're waging war, verse 21. I kept looking and that horn was waging war, that Caesar was waging war with the saints and prevailing against them until the Ancient of Days, that's the Father of Heaven, came and, and, and judgment was passed in favor of the saints of the highest one. And the time arrived when the saints took possession of the kingdom. So, they spread the truth all over. Look, look at verse uh, 23. And the fourth beast is the fourth kingdom, fourth kingdom of the earth. Uh, will be a fourth kingdom on the earth, that is Rome. And it will be different than the other kingdoms. And they would devour all these others and crush them. And let's skip down to um, verse 25. And he will speak against the most high and wear down the saints of the highest one. And he will uh, intend to make alterations in the times and in the law and will uh, have handed over to him 
uh, for times, times and a half, and, and we'll get into that maybe one day. Um, probably ought to have a separate class on Daniel. But the court will convene for judgment. The court of heaven, if you will, will convene. It's very similar to what you see in Job. What does is, what is Job reveal? The uh, children of God, the, the sons of God come before his throne, and they, they are discussing what to do with Job. And uh, that is kind of the contest that is going on uh, here too. So in verse 27, then the sovereignty and the dominion and the greatness of all kingdoms under the whole heaven will be given to the people of the saints of the highest one. His kingdom will be everlasting kingdom and all empires will serve and obey him. So did you ever think of the church as being that kind of thing? We don't normally. But the truth is we are the salt and the light of the world and we by bringing the, the truth forward and, and, and the gospel, we actually bring righteousness to the world. And in that sense, rule, uh, help to bring order and rule. In uh, Daniel chapter 2 and verse 44, he says, the days of the, uh, of the last set of uh, beasts and the last set of kings, he's talking about the Roman Empire. In the, last, in, in, in the days of these kings in the Roman Empire, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed. And the kingdom shall not be left to other people. It shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms and it shall stand forever. We are in that kingdom. Isaiah puts it this way. And look at the language that is, is a verbatim language that is used in Revelation that we will go to in a moment. So... Is glorious is his apparel, traveling in the greatness of his strength. I who speak in righteousness, mighty to save. I who speak in righteousness, mighty to save. He's talking about Christ. Why is your apparel red, someone says. Someone says to the Christ, why is your apparel red? Why are your garments like one who treads in the winepress? We have a song. He treads the winepress alone. Who's done that for us? What is the victory that is overcome? Satan wants your soul. Christ has already gone to the cross for us. He treads the winepress. I have tread the winepress alone from the peoples. No one was with me. For I have tread them in my anger and I have trampled them in my fury and their blood is sprinkled on my garments and I have stained all my robes and for the day of vengeance is in my heart and the year of my redeemed has come and I looked but there was no one to help and I wondered that there was no one to uphold therefore my own arm brought salvation for me See that language used here in Revelation 19. So we have here figurative language, but one that I think helps us to understand that Christ is not the, uh, in this role, in that this time, Christ is acting in a, as a spiritual victor to, to, to defeat all enemies. And uh, he is not the, uh, the humble, meek, lowly, one that we see coming into Jerusalem on the colt of a donkey. He is no longer in that role. He is in a different role. This is it. Look at verse 11, chapter 19. Then I saw heaven open and behold a white horse. And the one sitting on it was called faithful and true. And in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes are like a flame of fire. On his head are many diadems. And he has a name written that no one knows but himself. He is clothed in a robe dipped in blood. And the name by which he is called is the Word of God. And the armies of heaven arraigned in fine linen and white and pure were following him on white horses. And from his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. 
and he will rule them with a rod of iron, and he will tread the winepress of fury of the wrath of God, uh, the uh, wrath of God the Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh, he has uh, a name written, King of Kings, Lord of Lords. And so we have this imagery that is used to help us understand that we serve a master, a savior that knows us. He's a friend of ours. He's tender and loving and kind, but he is terrible and awful to those who would oppose him. And he wins the victory. There is, if you're struggling with sin in your life, he's won the victory. He's already won it. He's overcome. And, and we just have to try to be faithful in the best way we know how. Let's go back and look at some parts of this again. He comes in on a white horse. What's that symbolic of? A warrior, a commander, the victor. And he's sitting on it, and he is called faithful and true. Who is he faithful and true to? To the Father. He comes being faithful and true to the, what the Father had told him to say. So what, what he said in John in 14, 15, and 16 is that he doesn't speak things that, that the Father hasn't told him to speak. So he's faithful and he's true to what he was committed to do. He did it. And in righteousness now, he judges and makes war. He decides who is uh, opposing him and who is not, and then he makes war. His eyes are like a flame of fire, so he comes in vengeance. Does that not sound like uh, uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 and 7 through 9, where he, comes, he will come again uh, with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who know not God and obey not the gospel? This is the same kind of language that is used. And he is clothed in robe dipped in blood. Very much the same language that is used in Isaiah that we read. And the same language that is used in the winepress of the fury in Isaiah 60, whatever it was, 63 or 5. Okay, so what is it that he says here? He is called the Word of God. What, what does John 1 say that he is? In the beginning was the Word... And the word was with God, and the word was God. And so that word he uses here is, is symbolic. We'll see later, not in this. Well, yes, in verse 15 also. In this text and in other texts, we'll see that the, the, uh, the sword, what is the word of God? Uh, Ephesians 6 says the word of God is is a sword. What does Hebrews say? It's sharper than a two-edged sword. The word of God is sharper than a two-edged sword. It is proceeding out of his mouth. You see, the word of God is also the sword of God. It is the thing that slices and dices. It separates the soul from the spirit. It is able to deduce the intents of the heart. It is able to separate the intentions, even. The actions, for sure. And even our intentions. So it is the fury of his wrath that comes uh, out of it because of the, uh, the word of God, gives it the power and the strength. And thus, in many passages in the New Testament, we, we see that there is a day coming where every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus is Lord. And so the preacher usually says, don't you want to bow to him today and not on that day, on the great and terrible day where there's nothing to be done? He is the great and mighty God. But he's able to save us if we be but faithful. When he comes on earth the first time, the first accounts that we have, the gospel accounts that we have of him, in John chapter 5 and verse 44 and following, let's turn to that. You know this passage, but... Uh, maybe not in the context of Revelation or at him coming back as a warrior later. The contrast, I think, is pretty amazing, at least to me. Chapter 5 of John, verses 44 and following. Chapter 5 and verse 44 and following.
That's not the passage I wanted. Um, somebody Google that and give me the right reference. Uh, he comes in grace and truth. He came not to condemn the world, uh, to bring judgment to the world. Where is that passage? Came not to judge the world, bring judgment. If you find it, Google it for me. While you're doing that, you'll see that he came not to judge, but to warn, to give grace, to bring people to the Father. Uh, in the first advent, in the first coming, in living here on earth, his ministry was to bring us to the Father. So he came as grace and truth. But in the second one, in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 5 through 8, he comes, as I quoted earlier, to judge. And he comes back with his, his uh, angels in flaming fire. So the contrast between the two is amazing. Somebody, somebody Google that for me already? You don't make me do it. <laughs> you got the reference? Somebody have it? Well, John 3.17 is not where I'm thinking about, but uh, that's good. Uh, let's just go to that. It, it is. John 12.40. I'm thinking John 12.44 through 50 is what I'm thinking of. Let's turn to John 12. John 3.16, we know God so loved the world. All, and the next verse is very powerful too. But let's turn to John chapter 12. And it's verse 44 through 50. You know, and I'm doing these things sometimes, I use the, an, an organic uh, drive, and it doesn't always work. <laughs> okay, so uh, look at verse 44 and following. Yes, this is exactly right. He who believes in me, believes not in me, but in him who sent me. And uh, he who sees me, sees him who sent me. And I have come as a light into the world that whoever believes in me should not abide in darkness. And if anyone hears my words and does not believe, I do not judge him. This is a verse that people like to take out of context, right? Keep reading. I don't, I don't judge him. I didn't come into the world to judge, but to save the world. He who rejects me and does not receive my words has that which judges him. The word that I have spoken will judge him in the last day. For I have not spoken of my own authority, but the Father who sent me gave me a command, and that I should say, and, and, and what I should say, and what I should speak. And I know that his command is everlasting life. Therefore, whatever I speak, just as the Father told me, so I speak. Can you see now why Revelation reveals him as faithful and true? because he faithfully and truthfully spoke the word of God. He didn't come to judge the world. But when he comes back, what is his duty? It's a different mission. He came to speak and to say, bring light into the world, tell us what was right and wrong, get us straight, point us in the right direction, get us going the right way. But what does he say in verse 48? If you reject me and you don't receive that which I told you, you have that which will judge you in the last day. You, there will be a judgment. He's just not there to do it right then. There will be a judgment. What is it? The word that I have spoken will judge you in the last day. 1248. So um, he comes, grace and truth, word and savior, very gentle, very peaceful. But... Uh, except for the occasional encounter with uh, arrogant uh, uh, Pharisees that were teaching Aaron, and he wanted to bring them down a notch. All right, so just read chapter 23 of Matthew sometime. All right, so 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 9, um, he, he puts it this way. Uh, God is, is long-suffering, not willing that any should perish, that all should come to repentance. But what is it later? When time is over, when judgment day comes, when the great marriage feast occurs, what happens? How long until you will judge, the saints say? How long? How long would you tarry? We are looking for avenging our blood. People were martyrs. People, people died for the cause of Christ. And uh, we should be dying daily, right? Taking up our cross and dying daily to... Uh, the, the things that are put in our path to say no to self and yes to God. Maybe no to, uh, no to self and yes to others. All right, then um, 
Then I, shall, I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. Revelation 21, verse 1. Look at the language that is used in Isaiah 65. For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former things will, uh, shall not be remembered or come to mind. Uh, I see that as a real blessing, by the way. <laughs> former things will not come to mind. All the uh, things I wish I hadn't said, even today. Uh, all the things that I wish I hadn't done. Uh, all those things that we will have uh, regrets on. Guess what? In heaven, no regrets. Why? No memory. <laughs> no, no way to remember what you did wrong. So he's going to create a new heaven and a new earth, figuratively speaking. And it is just figurative because there will be no literal, physical uh, earth. First uh, Corinthians chapter 15, verses 22 through 26. So many people spend so much time thinking about what happens at the, uh, you know, at the eschatology, the end, end times, that they, they, they fail to see the value of the book is really related to overcoming evil and serving Christ and being faithful and overcoming. That's the story here, that our side wins, that Christ wins. But having said that, I have to give some lip service to a little bit of these end things. So uh, 1 Corinthians 15 tells us that, you know, at the end, he delivers the kingdom to the Father and he's destroyed everything. What's the last enemy? Death. When will that happen? When the earth is no more. When judgment day comes. When everything finishes. When it's over. Then the end comes. We're in the thousand year reign now. We're in the millennium. We're serving in his kingdom presently. Second Peter puts it this way. All material things will be burned. Everything will be set on fire. Hasten, we hasten the longing and hastening of the coming of the day of God because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved and the heavenly bodies will melt with uh, as, they, as they burn, or with fervent heat, the old King James puts it. Uh, but according to his promise, we are waiting for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. In paradise with God, we will have every opportunity to serve him with endless days, with no regrets, with no tear that won't be wiped away by the Father. It's beautiful. Now, what are some of the benefits of reading and hearing the book of Revelation? What has he said? What are some of the benefits that we've talked about? It'll help us overcome. It'll help us be faithful. It will give us a new name. You know, somebody close to me said, don't you feel like sometimes nobody really understands you? She wouldn't mean just me. You know, how each of us sometimes really kind of wonder if anybody really gets us. We get a new name. I think, I think Christ gets us. He understands us like nobody else. Not even our spouse, our mother, our father. He gets us. He gives us a new name. A name that's appropriate for us. And I thought of this. I thought of David Roberts. <laughs> Good to see you with us today. I thought, there's a guy that gets me a little bit. Um, now he's wondering if he gets me at all. But a very understanding man. If you get, don't know Dave, uh, you ought to get to know him. He's a very understanding guy. But as good as he is, it's wonderful to see you in, this, in the assembly today. Um, he's, a, he's a human. He's trained and he's, he's predisposed to be a very patient, hearing cultivating guy but he can't compare with our Lord nobody can compare with him and he gives us the name one day we'll be with him we'll sit at his feet we'll be there at his throne scene how about a Genesis and Revelation how are they connected you know if you overcome you get to eat of the tree of life where's the tree of life in Revelation it's in 
uh, the very, it's right there at the very end of the throne room. Where is the tree of life in, in uh, Genesis 1? It is in, um, in Eden. And so these two are connected. They are uh, imagery that we can identify with. In what way is Christ the Prince of Peace? And yet also in the final analysis, he is the final judge and conqueror with a bloody sword. In what way are these two reconciled? He is the Prince of Peace of those he would bring and reconcile to the Father. And he is the conqueror and the terrible to those who oppose the Father and his kingdom. So we have a big contrast. And this whole book is surrounded. It's, it's giving us imagery over and over and over again about good versus evil. About his armies, that would be us, and us. Uh, I'm sorry, his armies, and, uh, and we are part of that army, and his angels. And then the devil's army, and the devil, and his angels, and those who would be of the nations, as it referred to. I think you'll find it to be a very rewarding book. Try not to get too caught up into, what do these seven whatevers mean? And what do these whatevers mean? And when did this happen? Is that what happens at the very end and all? We'll get into some of that, but only because we have to. The real message is be faithful, overcome. We are more than conquerors in Christ. Thank you so much. Steve, be next week. Read chapter one. <laughs>